We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Morning, everyone. Yeah, I was thinking we should maybe do a scavenger hunt, see if you guys can find our desks. No one's going to find mine, I, I promise you. If you want to know where it is, I'll, you know, come up, I'll tell you, but you're not going to find it. Now, if you're, I want to just say one additional thing in addition to what Lance said, and then we'll dive into the message for today. If you're our guest with us today, I want to make sure you know uh, we don't want you to feel any pressure to give to this at all. This is for those of us who consider Seabreeze to be our church. We are so glad that you've decided uh, to check this church out, and in particular, uh, to investigate what it means to follow Jesus Christ uh, in the context of this particular church. Actually, as I've thought about it, uh, I, I think this is a great time. If you're new to Seabreeze, you're just checking it out, this, this is really a good time for you to be here while we're in the middle of, of trying to raise this money over these few weeks, because it's going to give you uh, really a, a unique and inside look into uh, how God works among us often. My hope is that this might actually uh, inspire you. Um, the reason is we are, as followers of Jesus, members of his church, we are part of the greatest movement for good that this world has ever seen. What most people don't realize is all of the good that we're talking about in this message series advanced because ordinary followers of Jesus, like you and me, decided to sacrifice to give of our time, to give of our money and resources. And that's really kind of the hidden um, part that most people don't think about, that what really drives a lot of the blessing uh, in this world. And we're just able to continue to do that in our place, in our time. So it was last week that we started this new series where we're looking at the difference that Jesus Christ has brought to our world. No thinking person can deny the impact of the Christian movement on our world. Uh, the movement is just simply too massive to ignore. In the final words of Jesus to his followers, Jesus predicted the worldwide impact that we have seen. These are his words recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says to them, and by extension to us, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. This is the city where they were when Jesus said this. And in all Judea, the kind of the surrounding area, <clears throat> Samaria, more of the Mediterranean basin, and to the ends of the earth, places like this. Now, looking back on this claim, it doesn't sound that shocking when you read it, because we're looking back on it. It's already happened. But just imagine how it must have sounded to those who first heard it as they looked around and thought amongst themselves, what, us? We're going to... We're going to impact the entire world? I mean, at that time, there were only about 500 followers of Jesus. By comparison, the top account on Instagram is soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo. He has 600 million followers, not 500, 600 million followers. Uh, on Twitter, or X, or whatever it's called now, Elon Musk, the owner of it, is the top account holder. He has 140 million followers. Now, granted, following someone on Instagram and Twitter is not really at all like following Jesus Christ. There's not a lot of demands on your life. But 600 million, 140 million, that's world influence size numbers. No one could have imagined that Jesus, with his 500 followers, would have ever changed the world. So at the time of his death, he had you know, no land. He had no official office of power or influence. He had not even talked about and had resisted any talk about a, a political kind of movement of any kind. Um, there was no military attached to him. The only military attempt was when Peter took out his sword when they were arresting Jesus and cut off the ear of one of the high priest's servants, and Jesus said, put that away. So no military, no no power base in that form at all. So even if you don't believe in what this man said and in what this man did, you have to at least marvel at the spread and the impact of the Christian movement and at least wonder 
How could this have happened? What is going on with this man? In fact, I want to give you um, a 2,000 year uh, view of the expansion of the Christian movement in the world. Business Insider did this uh, graphic video recently, and so I just want to want to show this is history. This is not a, a Christian video. This is just shows you the expansion of the Christian movement. So let's take a look at this, and then we'll continue on. So the impact of Christ on our world is undisputed. And just to be clear, there are Christians that went throughout the world, but those were the places where the Christian faith made a significant impact on that region of the world. Now, what is debated, what is not debated is the impact of the Christian movement. What is debated is in question is whether this expansion was a good thing or a bad thing. Now, our contention is that it was not just a good thing, it was a tremendous blessing. In fact, here's our contention. Jesus is the hidden blessing behind the modern world. If someone is not living in the modern world, they are trying to get to the modern world or trying to get the benefits of the modern world. And that's because everyone in the world knows that to live in the modern world comes with tremendous blessing. And our contention is that Jesus Christ is the one to thank for many of those blessings. So what we're doing in this series is we're looking at the history of the Christian origins that are behind many of the particular elements of the modern world that we consider to be a blessing. Today we turn our attention to one of the blessings of the modern world, and that is modern health care. If I had been born in Jesus' day, I would not have seen my 16th birthday. And that's because when I was 15, I had an emergency appendectomy to remove my appendix that was about to burst, and that saved my life. But that wasn't my only brush with death. Since then, I've had two surgeries to remove two different kinds of aggressive cancer in different parts of my body. Any of those two conditions, or the burst appendix, any of those three conditions would have taken my life. So I am tremendously grateful to be able to speak to you today, and it's because, in part, modern medicine. But not all is well with modern health care. My health care provider is Kaiser, and if you're a member of Kaiser, you probably have heard that Kaiser is facing a possible strike uh, on October 1st if an agreement isn't reached before then. If they strike, uh, it's claimed that this will be the largest strike of health care workers in our nation's history. And we don't really know all of what that will mean for our ability to get health care. Now, I don't know enough about the details of the dispute to weigh in and say who's right and who's wrong. I do know that what the issue is, there's two issues. One is staffing and the other is pay. There's not enough workers and they're not being paid enough. That's the contention. 
Now, this current crisis with Kaiser comes from two ideas that everybody agrees with, whether you're on the worker side of this dispute or you're on the management side of this dispute. No matter what side, if you're part of the modern world, you agree with these two contentions. Contention number one, idea number one, people with health problems should be taken care of. Every one of us, I think, would agree with that. That's, that's why this is a health care crisis, not just a health crisis, because we think care should be made available. People should be taken care of if they're sick. The second idea is that money should not prevent that care from occurring. In other words, you shouldn't have to be wealthy to be able to uh, be cared for when you're in need of, of treatment. Now, I'm not going to enter the debate on how you pay for health care, but I'm just simply saying, no matter where you are on whatever political spectrum, wherever you, whatever you think about how health care should be paid for, we all agree that it is a noble thing to provide care for people who are sick regardless of whatever their financial situation is. Now, we think that these two ideas are really what any decent human being thinks. That if you take anyone from any point in the world or any point in history, that they would agree with these two. But that is not true. This was not always the case. These two ideas did not occur naturally to humanity. You can trace both of these ideas back to one seed. And the seed is the parable of the Good Samaritan that Jesus taught. Jesus' followers took that, this parable, this story, seriously. And over time, they sought to try to figure out how to apply it to the health care needs that they saw around them. Which is why what Jesus taught now frames the modern debate that we have on health care. The story of the Good Samaritan is found in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. And in this story, Jesus answers two questions that form the foundation of all debates right now on modern health care. So I want to address these two questions that Jesus, has addressed, Jesus addresses in this parable and talk about how this has changed the modern world and your life and my life. Question number one that Jesus addressed is, who is my neighbor? This is critical when it comes to health care. Before Jesus, caring for the sick was primarily the concern of family and friends, unless you were influential and had resources. The idea that a community had any responsibility for its sick was never considered, and if it was, it was not taken seriously because it was not possible. That is before Jesus told this story. Jesus told this parable in response to this very question, he had been asked, who is my neighbor? And then he told this parable. So here's what is said leading up to the telling of this story. Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29. Here's what we read. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, by the way, if you read the Bible wanting to justify yourself, you're going to get nothing out of it. <laughs> but we struggle with this. He, wanting to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who, I'm, I'm adding the word technically, is my neighbor. Who really is my neighbor? Who, who, who do I need to care about? So this man clearly had heard Jesus speak on God's two greatest commandments. If you read earlier, Jesus is asked by somebody else, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus says, well, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he'd only been asked for the greatest, but he says this, and the second he said is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So this man clearly had heard it. So he He'd gotten the answer right on the first one because he'd heard Jesus do this. But he was asking it so that he could question Jesus on who exactly is our neighbor. And the reason is because he, along with some of the other teachers of law, 
had spent a long period of time, and you can read about this in the history of the Jewish people, they had come up with a very narrow definition of neighbor. They had defined it so narrowly so that pretty much any need around them they didn't have to get involved in because that person technically wasn't my neighbor. So in this story, Jesus tells of a man who was attacked by bandits, robbers on the road, and he's, he's robbed and then he's left for dead. Two men walk by, not together, but at different times, and both of them do absolutely nothing to help this man. This is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The first man to walk by was a priest. Now, you have to understand that the priest was, well, the highest member, uh, the most esteemed member of Jewish society. So the, the most venerated person walks by and does nothing. And we look at that and think, what is wrong with him? But you have to understand, that was normal. That's what everyone did. That's even the, the top moral person had no problem walking by this person lying there for dead. In fact, we are told he sped up a little bit because clearly this is a dangerous area. i got to get through here. Then the second was a Levite. This was the second most esteemed member of Jewish society. The third man was a Samaritan, which is why this is called the parable of the Good Samaritan. Samaritans were um, an ethnic group of people that were looked down on by the Jews. But it was... This man, the Samaritan, at the very bottom of this, this culture, who stopped and bandaged the man, put him on his donkey, transported him to the close inn, the inn that was nearby, and paid for the innkeeper to care for him until he recovered. So then Jesus, having just told this story, asks this expert in the law this. Verse 36, which of these three you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Well, how could you, I mean, you got it. So the expert in the law replied, I would love to have video on this. The one who had mercy on him probably was the attitude he said it with. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. No further questions, <laughs> you know. This pretty much makes it clear. Now, let me be very clear on this. Jesus is not, I'm not saying that Jesus is the father of medicine, of modern medicine even. That credit really goes to Hippocrates of ancient Greece. You know, he's the one who wrote the um, Hippocratic Oath, which established the, the basic ethics in medicine. And there is plenty of evidence of physicians and temples of healing in ancient Greece and in Rome before Jesus. But the practice of medicine before Jesus, was very different than what we have today. Not just different because of the advances of science and knowledge. It was very different in its scope. Who has access to it? That's one of the biggest differences. You know, the Hippocratic Oath, if you read through it, it does call for providing care for the poor. But when you look at what happened in ancient Greece and Rome and the ancient world, that is not what happened. The physicians served exclusively the wealthy and the powerful of the ancient world. That's the only way they could make a living. There were, to be fair, temples of healing. And you might read temples of healing and think, oh, a place where people could be cared for, but that's not what they were. They were simply for the masses, but it's where the masses would go and simply ask the gods to heal them. So it was a place of prayer, not, not a place of care or healing, or treatment. No actual health care was provided in these temples of healing. Now, this lack of care for our neighbors was evident as you read through the record of history in the ancient world whenever a plague would hit a city or a region in the ancient world. And you can do the research for yourself. I'm just going to give you a couple of data points. In 430 B.C., there was a massive plague that swept through Athens. And there was an Athenian, Athenian general by the name of Thucydides that gave um, an account of this plague. And here's one of the things he says about how people responded. He said, the living resolved to spend quickly and enjoy themselves regarding their lives and riches as alike things of the day. 
In other words, they had a very fatalistic, we're all going to die, let's enjoy our lives. And in other words, they, they just turned completely selfish. Forget about helping others. We're all going to die, let's just enjoy what we have and then die. It's every person for themselves. But Jesus taught in this parable and then lived by his life a very different response. What Jesus taught in this story is that your neighbor is not just someone close to you that you care about already. It is also everyone that you pass, even an enemy, even someone you might look down on. Those religious leaders in the story who passed by the wounded man in Jesus' parable probably felt no guilt in doing so because it was the common way. They had no category like we do now that that's just not right. But Jesus created this category of care when he said, very simply, go and do likewise. What he's saying is, I'm not just telling you a story to answer your question about who is my neighbor. I'm telling you the story to change the world's view of people who are in need and sick. Go and do likewise. Now, Jesus didn't just say these words. He lived these words. Most of his miracles were healing miracles. Leprosy was the plague of his day. Lepers had to identify themselves in two ways, physically and verbally. They, they had to wear um, torn clothing that identified them at a distance as having leprosy. And then just to make sure there was no mistake, whenever someone would be approaching them at a distance, they had to holler in a loud voice, unclean. Basically, stay away. This was the plague of Jesus' day. But Jesus would approach lepers and talk to lepers and heal lepers. In fact, this was one of the reasons why the religious leaders thought he can't be from God because clearly he can't even tell a leper from a healthy person because he's walking up to these lepers and he's touching them and he's healing them. These words in the example of Jesus showed up in his church after his departure from earth. In AD 250, there was a plague in the city of Alexandria. Dionysus describes how people behaved during this health crisis. Here's what he said. They thrust aside anyone who began to be sick and kept aloof even from their dearest friends and cast the sufferers out upon the public roads half dead, leaving them unburied. But then he paints a contrast. This is how most in the city responded. But Dionysius was the bishop, pastor of the church in that city. And he goes on to say this, Very many of our brethren did not spare themselves, but kept by each other and visited the sick without thought of their own peril, and ministered to them assiduously, and treated them for the healing in Christ, died from time to time, most joyfully drawing upon themselves their neighbor's diseases. Now, the impact of Jesus wasn't limited just to the response to disasters and plagues. In AD 369, I mentioned this last Sunday, uh, the church started the first hospitals. This one was St. Basil, motivated by uh, the teaching and the love of Christ. He is credited with creating the first true hospital, not, not a care center, but a, a true hospital in the city of Caesarea. And that idea spread, spread from Caesarea to Alexandria, to Ephesus, to Constantinople. Now, let me be clear. The knowledge and the study of medicine is in no way limited to the regions that have been impacted by the Christian faith. You can find plenty of evidence of medical study and advances and cures, not only in ancient Greece, but also among the Arab nations and throughout China and in India. Throughout the world, many people were learning and advancing and trying to figure out how to cure the different diseases that those regions face. So I'm not saying that the part of the world that the Christian faith impacted that's the only place where thinking on medicine occurred in advance. That's not true. But what I am saying is modern medicine did not arise from any of those places. 
It started in the West, where the Christian faith had tremendous impact. And it was started for the most part, not exclusively, of course, but for the most part, it was started by followers of Jesus. Why? Why did modern medicine start there and by Christians and not in other parts of the world and by Muslims or Hindus or followers of Confucius? Well, to understand why, you have to answer the second question that Jesus addresses in this parable. The second question is this, why should I sacrifice for a stranger? The first question deals with who should I care about? This question deals with why should I care? What what is my motive? And if you're going to have something like modern medicine, you have to address the motive. What is going to be the reason that's driving this? Why should I care? When we think of modern medicine, we tend to think primarily of the science part, the advances that have more than doubled our life expectancy. And that is definitely a part of modern medicine. But as you study the history of it, there was a deeper foundation that came first before the science and turned out to be the context in which the science could occur and the key driver that allowed the knowledge to gain access to the people that were sick. The idea that healthcare should be available to complete strangers was the essential foundation on which the knowledge of medical science needed to rest, if it was going to make a difference in this world. You know, sacrificing your money, your time, and even your health for a stranger is the foundation on which modern medicine is built. And you have to understand, that is not a natural impulse. Whenever sickness strikes, our natural impulse is not to risk and sacrifice to care for others. Our natural impulse is to isolate and care for ourselves. Given the limited resources in this world, our survival has always made selfishness the most rational choice. So if we're going to overcome selfishness so that people can be cared for, there needs to be a reason, a compelling reason, that will get enough people to actually care. So again, why should we sacrifice for a stranger? The reason is because Jesus himself, the one we follow, did it repeatedly, and he told us to do it. And not just that he did it, that's reason enough, but what he did in this story is he linked a love for God to a love for our neighbor. He made it clear that these two cannot be separated. This was a new idea. You know, that you should care about people? Sure, that idea had been around. But that if you say you love God and you don't love people made in God's image, those two don't go together, that was a teaching of Jesus. That was new. Jesus made it clear, if you really love me, then you're going to love those made in my image. Later in the book of 1 John, it says it very clearly, anyone who claims to love me but hates his brother is a liar. Because if you can't love someone you can see, how are you going to love someone you can't see? That's the link that's made in the New Testament. So this means love for strangers like that man lying on the side of the road in Jesus' parable. And this is what the followers of Jesus did. And it provided the context, the foundation, the engine for modern medicine. One medical historian who is a professor at the University of California in San Francisco wrote a book called Mending Bodies, Saving Souls, A History of Hospitals. You can read it. He traces modern hospitals back to early Christian care centers. This is before the science. The care part preceded the science part. Long before nursing existed, early Christians went out of their way to nurse anyone who needed care as people fled from earthquakes and fires and epidemics, the Christians became known as those who were running towards those things, kind of like the Marines in that commercial. The Christians were running towards the chaos and the sickness. And then in the Middle Ages, two amazing things began to emerge. First was the emergence of what 
became, historians call, cathedral hospitals. A cathedral hospital was simply a early hospital built on church property, a cathedral property, funded by the church. Those were some of the early hospitals. They began to emerge. And then shortly after cathedral hospitals, what also happened on the same property adjacent to the hospitals launched cathedral schools. Historians agree that it was the cathedral schools that provided the context that launched the scientific revolution. It was in these schools. But there's an interesting thing that happened because these both, the presence of both, a hospital and a school on church property, funded by church resources, was the beginning of the merging of modern medicine with the care and scientific practice. This is the foundation of modern medicine. But what about the people? You know, I've been talking about kind of the big picture context and what churches did to start schools and hospitals and then the merging of science and care and how that's benefited us. But there are people, followers of Jesus, that are key in this process. One historian I read says it this way. As I explored the origins of modern medicine, I was surprised to find devout Christians at nearly every turn. You can do the research yourself. I mean, not just individuals, but institutions. I mean, study the history of the Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins University. All of these were started by Christians to care for the sick. But let me just give you two examples of individuals that stand out on this. There's many more, but we don't have time for that. First one I want to share with you is his name is Edward Jenner. He's considered to be the father of immunology because he created the first vaccine, the vaccine against smallpox. Now, this is an amazing statistic. In the 100 years before he created the smallpox vaccine, 500 million people died of smallpox. 500 million. The population of our nation is 340 million. The 100 years before, 500 million had, had been killed by smallpox. And many, many more had been maimed by that disease, but still lived. His vaccine made smallpox the very first disease on the planet ever to be eradicated. To this day, scientists marvel at how he could have possibly created the first vaccine, given the fact that he didn't have access to the tools that are used now. Well, this was his explanation before his death. This is what he said about his contribution to health care. He says, I'm a follower of Christ. I'm a tool in the hands of God. And as I follow God with my gifts to help the poor and the sick, God will use me as an instrument to convey his good to my fellow creatures. Scientists debate on how many hundreds of millions of lives his efforts, his invention, has saved over the course of history. Another person, Florence Nightingale, we've heard of her. She is considered to be the founder of modern nursing. In fact, you may not know this, but she is the one who created the layout of the modern hospital. So the way hospitals are laid out now started in her mind. In 1854, she left her life of comfort and went to the front lines of the Crimean War to care for the wounded and the sick. Like the followers of Jesus before her, she risked disease and death on behalf of strangers. Why? The example of Christ. This is what she says. One of her common quotes is this, The kingdom of heaven is within, but we must also make it without. Jesus is the one who referred to Following him is to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. She says it's got to show up not only in here, but in our world. So modern medicine started in the West not because these and other Christians were the first or the only ones to advance medicine. No, the Greek physicians were first. Later, the Muslim physicians, Chinese, Indian physicians brought advances in medicine to the East, in the Mideast. So again, why didn't modern medicine start there and spread from there? It's because the ideas that are needed to support modern medicine must also find support in the culture in order for it to advance. It was the teachings of Jesus on this topic that provided the motivation behind modern healthcare. Now, the knowledge part 
is not enough. Without the care, it's just treatment. So back to the health care crisis with Kaiser right now. Why is there a threat of a strike? Well, it goes back to something that Jesus said in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Notice this in verse 35. The next day, the Good Samaritan took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And there it is. Health care is expensive. Always has been. That's the real reason why caring for anyone other than the rich or the family members was never even considered. It just wasn't practical. But then Jesus taught in the parable that it should be done for what reason? Love. The Christian word is charity. That is what funded modern medicine. Charity is the why. But healthcare now, of course, isn't a charity, it's a business. It accounts for almost 20% of our economy. 20%. That changes the why from love to profit. Profit is not bad, but it's just different. Now, just to be clear, I'm not saying that nurses shouldn't be paid and that no one working in healthcare actually cares for their patients. That's not, that's not the case. But what I am saying is you can't change the why, the motive, without incurring a never-ending fight over the resources. And that's what we have. Remove charity from health care? Is there any surprise that we have a crisis? I mean, locally, St. Joseph's was started by nuns out of charity. Hogue was started by seven church members, a pastor and a doctor. You can read the story. Motivated by charity for the sick, not to make a profit. Now, I don't know how you can unravel at this point. I mean, I don't know how you undo the industrial medical complex, or even that if you should. But I do know that what moved those early Christians is what should move us now. Charity for our neighbors, both the ones we know and the ones we don't know. So I want to close with two applications. I don't know how to solve the health care crisis. That's a bigger problem than any of us know how to do. But I do know if we get back to what Jesus called us to do, we can make a difference where we are, and God might spread that. So here's two applications. One, if you're sick, and the other, if someone else is sick. So both sides of this equation. If you are sick, don't suffer alone. Let other Christians know so they can care. Don't take that gift away from them. My preference when I get sick is to disappear. You know, I mean, just, I don't need anything. I don't want to bother anyone. But in doing so, I fail to recognize that I am a part of the body of Christ. As a follower of Jesus, I'm a part of the body. And when our physical bodies get sick, does a part of our body just go off and do something else? No, we're all in it together. And this is part of God's design in sickness is to give us the opportunity to care for each other. But if we're all independent and arrogant and we don't let anyone know, we're robbing them of the opportunity to care for us. So don't suffer alone. Let people know. Second application, if someone else is sick, don't leave health care solely to the professionals. What I'm saying here is people need care, not just treatment. We tend to think in our modern culture, if they've got access to a doctor or a nurse, they're good. But we need much more than that. You may not know how to set a bone or deliver a baby, but you can bring a meal to a family who's just had a baby or someone fighting the flu. We are not just bodies. We are souls. We're not just bodies that need to be fixed. We are souls that need to be cared for. And when we're sick, we need care. And we need encouragement. So you and I can't solve the health care problems. But we can, in the words of Jesus, go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, I pray that right now you make it clear to us how we can go and do likewise what that means for us, what that looks like for us. We thank you for the men and women who have gone before us and who have sacrificed of their money, of their minds, of their lives, of their time, so that we can benefit from all the blessings of modern health care. But God, I pray that you would help us not just to turn this over to the professionals, 
or the government, but that we would get involved as we see people in need of care. Help us to know what to do and when to do it. We pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.